And welcome to the service with the difference. It is the 12th of March, 2023. It is our third Sunday in Lent. And again, Lent is the season of preparation as we prepare our hearts and our minds for, for the season of Easter. It's just that season, again, that helps us to get to Easter, really appreciating the sacrifice, really appreciating the gift that God gives us in Christ, in his death, and even more in, in his resurrection. Um, we are going on a journey this 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 season of looking at the vows we make as we go through the water in baptism, where we say to God that we love him and our love for him looks like um, us turning away from everything that is not God and us turning turning towards everything that, that is God. And so I will repent of the sin I have and turn away from everything that is evil. Um, we looked at that in the first week, last week, and this week we are looking at how I will trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And then for the next two weeks, we'll be looking at what it looks like to serve Christ in the church and in the world. And then that takes us, obviously, to, to Palm Sunday. Um, today we are reading from Psalm 95, just a psalm inviting us to come and worship God, come and sing for joy to the Lord. Um, and if you should hear the voice of God today, don't, don't harden your heart to what God has to say. Open your heart to what God has to say, because everything that God has to say is good and it is right and it is true. And then we are also reading from Exodus chapter 17. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 7. Um, the Israelites have come out of Egypt. They're wandering around the desert. Um, they've gone without food. They complained. God gave them food. They have gone without, gone without, but to water, God sweetened the water. They are now at a space in Rephidim where there is no water and they are complaining. And God tells Moses to take the elders to go to knock the rock with his stick and water will flow from there. Um, and so the elders are there to bear witness to the miracle that God um, does in order to provide for, for the Israelites. And then we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 11, um, where Paul is again saying to the people of Rome, we have been justified by faith and we have peace with God now. Um, and we have peace with God because God has made peace with us through the work of Christ. And then we're going to be reading from John chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 5 to verse 42. It is the story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus meets the woman at the well. He asks her for some water. And she goes through a thousand excuses why she shouldn't be talking to Jesus, let alone giving him, him water. Um, but eventually she, she recognizes him for the Messiah that he is. And she invites everybody in the town to come and listen to, to, to the story. Um, that she has experienced and they hear from Jesus for themselves. And so they, they, they put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the one who was promised. Um, and again, I'm going to ask that you put this on pause as you first read through those readings. And as you read through them, we give God thanks for them. And we pray that he bless them to us as we reflect on them in, in this moment. Last week, we looked at um, Nicodemus and the story of Nicodemus' struggle to, to trust Jesus, um, how his, his knowledge of the law and, and the stuff that he understood about God, how that was getting in the way of his, his trusting Jesus. He knew God was with Jesus, but he struggled to trust Jesus. We also looked at Abraham, the story of Abraham, as, as Abraham needed to, to trust God and follow where, where God was going. And the thing that would have gotten in the way for Abraham in his trust of God is his name, his heritage, where he comes from. And so God says, I need you to leave that behind um, and follow me so that you can trust me and, and go where I'm leading you to go. And this week we are looking at how the Israelites are walking around the desert. Um, they have been complaining the whole time that, that they're going to die. Um, and again, God provides for them as, as a means of getting them to trust him. But Obviously, that journey for them took 40 years. That's why they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years before God knew they were ready to, to enter into the promised land. And, and we're also looking at the story of the Samaritan woman um, who, who needed to, to trust Jesus. And as we, as we said last week, as we are journeying through, through Lent, you know, we really are considering what it means for us as believers to, to claim faith in Christ and, and what it means for us to continue our lifelong growth in Christ as, as a part of his community of, of faith. Um, and so again, we look today at that promise. Do you, 
do you trust in Jesus as your Lord? Do you trust in Jesus as your Savior? Um, and I guess as we read from the story of the Samaritan woman, we could ask that question, are you willing to drink from the living water that Christ is, is offering to you? Um, and, and as you think of your life, as you want to answer that question, as you think of your life, uh, I wonder if you have ever known anybody that you can trust with, with your life. And the fact is, we, we are people, you know, we, we get it wrong, we misunderstand others, um, we are misunderstood. And, and that means, obviously, that we are going to have our trust broken at times, and, and sometimes we are going to break other people's trust. And, and this is the nature of life, we know that. Um, but we also know that after enough times of being let down, part of our human nature is to put up this protective wall. You know, to build this wall between us and others. And eventually, if we have been let down enough and in substantial enough ways, you know, we, we just we get to that point where we don't trust anybody. We, we only trust ourselves, if, if that at all. Now, when we fall in love with God, um, that wall that we have built to separate us from others, to protect us from others, that, that's the same wall that stands between, between us and God. And, and we find that, especially in, in the beginning of our relationship with God, you know, we, we tend to continue relying on ourselves rather than allowing God, God to renew us. And so God's desire to be in a relationship with us is, is far greater than our need to protect ourselves. And so God continues to fill us with his Holy Spirit. And brick by brick, he breaks down the wall of our defense. Brick by brick, he calls us into a loving relationship with him. Um, but it's not just a relationship. It's a relationship of trust. and and so as it's a brick by brick story, this is a journey that, that most of us need to need to go on. Because in our lives, we, we do have boundaries. In our, in our lives, we have many bricks that have been placed into this wall that protect us from, from others. In, in, this, in the case of the Israelites, they feared letting go of their security. They had security in, in Egypt. They had a sense of safety in Egypt. They were unhappy. They were complaining like hell. But... But even in that, they, they had a sense of security. You know, they're going on this journey and, and they know that in the wilderness, as they're going to the promised land, as they're going and, and settle in a land that God has promised them, as they leave Egypt, they know that they're going to face real, real threats. And, and they really have tried to trust God. You know, there's one million plus people and livestock and everything walking around this, this hot desert, walking around this dry desert. And, and, they, and they are settling for now in a place that, that has no water. And, and obviously, without doubt, that's a threat to, to their survival. If I was an Israelite, I, I guess I would also be complaining in this moment. God has proved faithful. He was faithful. He was present with them in the Exodus. He saved them from the Egyptians in the Exodus. Um, when they were complaining of the bitter water at Mara, he, he made the water sweet. And the water was good enough to, to satisfy the needs of all of these people. Um, for an extended period of time. When they were hungry, when they were saying, we've got nothing to eat, he provided them with, with manna. Um, and that manna has been present with them the whole time, and they have enough to eat. And, and once again, in this story, God has shown his, his faithfulness. Um, and he has done that in front of the elders. So there are people who will testify to, to what God has done, that it is not just a natural occurrence, but that God has been involved in, in their salvation. But I, again, I want to say in the face of dehydration, you know, I wouldn't at all blame them for, for their complaining. They, they've, they've already got this incredibly big wall that exists between them and God. They, they don't know who God is. They don't know what it means to, to be free because they only know what it means to be slaves. They only know what it means to be a slave to an Egyptian master and to an Egyptian master's gods. Um, now, at this point in their, in their history, they are adding even more bricks to the wall that exists between them and God because they're afraid of the unknown. They're afraid for, for their survival. You know, they don't know if they're going to survive or not. They, they don't know God and they don't know whether God is a spiteful God or, or not because some of Egypt's gods were, were spiteful. And so even in this moment, because they're already on the back foot, their wall is just getting higher and higher and higher with every struggle that, that they go through. And that's, and that's why it takes them 40 years to learn how to trust God. It's 40 years worth of God breaking down brick by brick by brick as much as they are willing to trust him, as much as they are, are willing to allow him to, to lead them and lead them into 
the promise that he has made to them. In the story of the woman at the well, this, this woman reminds Jesus that Jesus is breaking his own customs. You know, he, he is a male who is out in the open speaking to a female, a strange female. Um, it's, he is a Jew speaking to a Samaritan. He is a Jew asking a Samaritan for help. He is a Jew willing to drink out of a Samaritan's container, which would be an unclean container. It doesn't come out of a Jewish household. comes out of a Samaritan household, so therefore it is unclean. And so she is using all of these reasons to, to not engage in this conversation. You know, there are many safeguards in place that, that should protect Jesus from interacting with her. And she is using his own customs to try and push him away. Um, and in fact, she's even put in, in, in place some of her own safeguards to, to try and protect her from having to interact with, with anyone, let alone a Jewish male, let alone Jesus. The fact that she comes to the well at midday is a means of ensuring that she will, will be alone. And I, and I wonder what some of the things are that, that you and I have put in place so, to, so that we don't have to engage with Jesus. You know, what are some of the walls that we have put in place to protect ourselves from letting go of our own autonomy completely? What are, what are some of the defenses we have put in place to protect ourselves from giving ourselves fully to Christ? Um, and they are all things we fear. Obviously, they're things that we, we fear. But perfect love drives out fear. And that's what happens with the Samaritan woman. Christ comes and he just loves her. And that love drives out fear. That love opens her eyes to who he is. And she lets go of her desire for, for control. And so Jesus proposes her, you know, will you, will you believe? Do you trust in me? That, that's the proposal for us. Will you trust me as your Lord? Will you trust me as your, your Savior? And Jesus is saying to her, will you trust me with yourself and as God works to draw us deeper into him as he as he works to draw us deeper in into a relationship with him because we need his help to fall deeper in love with him he, he proposes a relationship in which we are fulfilled completely and in which he is fulfilled completely because he is fulfilled completely by us being in love with him and it is a relationship of, of trust in fact the best relationships are those where we are free to live without fear of being hurt without fear of being betrayed um, one in which we are able to trust the other person completely. We know that they're going to hurt us as we are going to hurt them, but we are able to trust them with our lives. We are able to trust them with our hearts. We, we are able to, to trust them with, with our fears. And, and whatever this woman's story is, you know, whether she has had five husbands who have died or, or whether she is barren and so her husbands have divorced her, she, she hasn't bothered to get married again because, you know, what, what's the point? Why would I get married again if I am barren? If I get married to this one, will he not just die like the others have died? And so she is sidelined herself and she has been sidelined because everybody else is afraid that they're going to catch what, what she's got. Um, and so in her life, she has accepted that she is never going to be fulfilled. She has accepted that her life is incomplete. Um, and she's not even going to work on her relationship with the villagers. That's why she comes to fetch wa water in, in the middle of the day in, in the boiling hot sun. Um, and so she is asking Jesus for the living water that he is talking about because she thinks it's going to make her life easier. Because, you know, then she's, she, she's never going to have to come and fetch water. If the river is running past her house, house then, you know, gee, Jesus, that would make my life a whole lot easier. Um, but she actually needs the living water not to make her life easier. She needs the living water to make her life complete. Jesus knows what's going on in our heart. Um, he knows whether her community want to speak to her or, or whether they don't want to speak to her. And so he says to her, I will speak to you. In fact, I, I will love you and I will give your life hope. I will give your life purpose. I will give you a life. You, you, you won't amble, but you will, you will run. I will give you something to, to live for. And so part of what makes the story of the Samaritan woman such a beautiful story is the connection to the betrothal stories that we find in, in the Torah. Um, the, that part of the Old Testament that the Samaritans and, and the Jews share, the first five books of, of the Christian Bible. And so Rebecca in Genesis chapter 4 is at the well when the servant comes to fetch a wife for, for Isaac. Rachel is at the well, um, Genesis chapter 29. For, for, for Jacob um, and Moses finds Zipporah at the well in, in Exodus chapter 2. And these, these stories are all taking place at a well 
and they and they would have been a part of the Samaritan scriptures. They would have known these stories. A man goes to the well. A man asks for a drink from a woman, and that woman is to to become his his bride. And so Jesus comes to the well and he asks this woman for a drink, and she goes and fetches the villagers, who who all come and become a part of the bride of Christ, and they become a part of the bride of Christ in a way that the Jews will never be able to become because they have all these preconceived ideas of who God is and of what the Messiah looks like and of who belongs in, in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus proposes her, will you trust me? Will you trust me with yourself? As he proposes us, will we trust him with ourselves? And our response to that is what is the fulfillment of this proposal. Our response to that is I will. But I recognize that I'm going to need God's help to do that. With God being my helper, I will trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And so Jesus offers her this living water, and it's water that is flowing. It's not the stagnant water that she finds in the well. It is fresh. It's alive. It is nourishing. It is healthy. It is moving, and it is ready to take you in, in, its, in its flow, in its stream. And so as water is essential to, to sustain physical life, the living water is essential for a fulfilled life, for, for an eternal life, for a life that leads others to a fulfilled life. The living water that Jesus is referring to in, in his conversation with the Samaritan woman is obviously, that's the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that flows out of the heart of the one who knows that they have been redeemed by God. It's the Holy Spirit that flows out of the heart in, in a volume that is directly correlated to the amount of trust that that heart places in, in God. And obviously this image then takes us back to Revelation 22, um, where John speaks of the river of life that flows from the throne that, that brings healing, you know, wherever it goes. Can you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior on the throne of your heart? Who is on the throne of your heart? Is, is it Christ? If it is Christ, then the Holy Spirit, the living water, is flowing from the throne that is on your heart. And that Holy Spirit is flowing into the world and it is infecting the world with the goodness of God, with the love of God. It is, it is because the Holy Spirit is within you and flowing out from you that the world will know that they are loved by God. And this God who, who loves them perfectly is a God that they can trust. He is a God they can trust because he loves them perfectly. His love is, is without error. His love is without fault. His love is without spite. He, he has no reason to get anyone. He, he just he wants to love. And the Holy Spirit that flows from our lives into the world is a, is a river of life. It is a river that brings healing wherever it goes. You know, nothing else that we put our trust in, nothing else that we can put our hope in will ever quench our thirst. Nothing else will ever fill our soul. It's, it's only the one who, who created us um, that can quench our thirst. Blessed are those, says Jesus, who, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're the ones who will be satisfied. Um, the only water that will quench our thirst is, is the living water. Um, Jesus says to his disciples when they say, do you want something? He says, I've already eaten something. Um, doing the work of God, that is what I am satisfied in. I am hungry for the work of God and doing the things of God. The Samaritan woman knows that she can trust Jesus because he knows everything about it, but still he, he doesn't condemn her. You know, in fact, he, he continues to engage respectfully. He, he continues to engage respectfully in conversation with her. He doesn't speak down to her, but he, but he answers her questions and he, and he takes her, her seriously. You know, even when the disciples come, he continues to take her seriously and continues to, to answer her questions. And, and it's this acceptance of her that leads her to run and to go and fetch the rest. Because she's saying, if I know that I am accepted, if I know that I'm loved by God, I don't have to fear that anybody else is going to reject me. I love you because I am loved by God. It's about God. It's, it's, it's not about me. God has made something beautiful out of this woman's life. God has made something beautiful out of my life. And so will you trust Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior? Will you allow him to make something beautiful out of your life? Pray with me. Lord God, it is in the dry and, and the arid environments of our hearts that we know you are the one who brings refreshing. Help us to receive you. Help us to receive the water of life. 
Help us to stop building walls and, and looking for ways to keep you out, to keep others out. Lord God, there are many amongst us who need to receive love, who need to receive you. There are many who, who have love to give. And so we ask that you open our hearts and our walls to trust you because you are our Lord. You are our Savior. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that that water of life that flows from the throne will just come and wash the walls that we have built away. That as we look, it will be clean and new and good. Convict us, Lord Jesus, of that with every fiber of our being. We pray this in your precious, precious name. Amen. Amen.